Good morning, everybody. How's Faith Baptist Church doing today? It's good to see you all. We are so glad that you are here at church today. Uh, every time we gather, God does amazing things, right? But these days are special when we can start in the midst of a, thankfully, nice, warm baptistry. And so we have two baptisms for you today. And uh, that is always great evidence that God is working uh, not just in the midst of the church, but he's working in the midst of lives. So we're going to open the service with one baptism, and then we're going to end the service with a second baptism. So we're going to go ahead and have our, our first come on in. This is Miss Emma Fillmore. Miss Emma, come on in. The water's fine. Most of you know this sweet girl. If you don't, again, this is Miss Emma Fillmore. Uh, her mom is Erica. Her dad is Brother Josh, who's up there, works in the booth. And uh, Miss Emma's been raised in church all of her life. Miss Emma actually made a profession of faith when she was five years old. But God has been working on her heart pretty heavily, right? The last, you've been pretty kind of miserable and scared, right? For the last few weeks and months. And it came to a point a couple weeks ago, just after hearing a series of messages, not even at church, but a part of, uh, in the homeschool co-op that uh, many of our families are a part of here, that God convicted and gripped her heart. And it was, uh, I think, a Monday night or a Tuesday night at home that uh, she went and grabbed her daddy and shared exactly what was going on in her heart. And she goes, Dad, I know that I made a profession when I was five, but I know that every time when someone asks me if I'm saved or not, that I'm lying to them when I say yes. And I am so proud of her, and I told her that in my office. Thank you for responding to the call of God. What a testimony this girl is. And, and let me just plug this real quick. Some of us need to follow the testimony of this girl. Some of you are here every single week, and don't get me wrong, I'm thankful for that. But you have made a profession of faith, or maybe you haven't, and you think that by coming here you're going to be good, but you know in your heart you're not saved. And if life ended today, hell would be where you, your destination would be. You need to respond and repent and believe on the Lord Jesus. And I'm so thankful that of the testimony of Miss Emma here. And so, Miss Emma, before uh, your family here at the church, at Faith Baptist Church, have you truly repented of your sin and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes, sir. By your public profession of faith. Go ahead and clap for us. That's fine. You're going to get clapped to a bunch today. It's exciting. Emma Fillmore, by your public profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister in Christ. Go ahead and hold your nose there. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection, to walk in newness of life. Praise God. Praise God. Pray for that young lady. She's special. God's going to use her in many mighty ways. I want to welcome you again to Faith Baptist Church. What a way to start our service today. If you're a guest with us today, it's your first time here. Man, I want to welcome you. You're our VIPs this morning. If it is your first time here, you're going to see blue and white cards on those chairs in front of you. We call those our Connect cards. Would you mind grabbing that card and filling out just a little bit of information about yourself? Uh, we also on the screens here to my left and right have a digital option so you can scan that QR code on your phone and submit that form. Um, we are not going to show up at your door unannounced. We're not going to bother you like a uh, telemarketer would. That just goes to my office, and I want to send you a letter in the mail this week thanking you for worshiping with us. What a great day it's going to be. Amen? We have, uh, let's pray and start. We have several that are out due to sickness today, and as we pray and ask God to bless our service, I also specifically want to pray for Brother Johnny Marshall. Notice he's not with us this morning. Brother Johnny is in the hospital down in Bartow. He's got an infection in his toe. Um, it's went septic, and it's actually in the bone. So he has been very sick. As of yesterday, he was in the ICU. I'm not sure. Have they moved him out of ICU? Or is he, he is out of ICU now. So he is on a general floor, which is a good sign. He's feeling much better. But there's still a, a possibility that Brother Johnny may lose his toe. So let's go before the Lord and ask him to be with us in our service today. But let's pray for Brother Johnny as well. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for new life. And I get excited about that. God, when I think of the wretch that we are and the sin that we even still harbor in our hearts against you, the fact that you save a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, God, that we can come in a, a baptistry and just proclaim to the world that we're followers of you because you've changed our heart, is I'll never understand that miracle. I'm thankful for it. God, we need you today. 
God, as we gather here, again, we know that there are hurting hearts sitting in this audience. We know that there are discouraged people, depressed people, hopeless people, some who may not even know why they're here today, but you have brought them here. God, I ask that you will just use this service to encourage those hearts and lift them up. And God, for those that are lost in here that do not know you, the ones who have been playing church and playing the nice guy and nice girl game, Father, that today you would wake them up to their sin, that they would, uh, couldn't help but call upon you and repent before they leave this building today. Father, we thank you again for all the things you're going to do. We pray for a special prayer for Brother Johnny this morning. That you'll continue to heal his body. We thank you, Lord, that he is feeling better enough to be moved out of the ICU. But, Lord, we're praying for this infection that's going through him. I pray that you'll heal it. Lord, I pray that you'll take the infection out of his toe. Lord, we're praying that if it be according to your will, Lord, that this toe would be saved. Father, I pray that you will give the Marsh family encouragement as any time a loved one is in the hospital and struggling with health. It's a very discouraging thing. Lord, I just pray that you'll bless him, bless the family. And bless us today, God. Let nothing in here today be about man. Let it all be about you and give you the glory. We're thankful for you, Father. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. It's great to see everybody. I wanted to start off by reading some scripture. And uh, when I was trying to think about what songs we were going to do today at church, um, the holiness of God came to mind. Something that we need to focus on more serving a holy God. And I'm going to read three different passages here in Revelation. Um, first one, Revelation 4, 8 through 11. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who lived forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy O Lord and receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created skipping ahead and I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seven seals thereof. And then lastly, in Revelation 5, 13 through 14, it says, And every creature which is in heaven, every creature, and on earth, and under the earth, and such are at the sea and are in them, and that are in them, Heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four be said, Amen. And the four and the twenty elders fell down and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. Let's stand this morning and sing this song. Holy, holy. 
Well, he is definitely almighty and worthy to praise. And I'm thankful for that. Amen. Uh, if I can have our ushers come forward, please. So I just want to welcome everybody who's visiting. Thank you again for being here today. And uh, you're our honored guest. And as Pastor mentioned, uh, from the baptistry, which I'm excited about this morning, if you can't tell, um, there is a connect card in front of your seat. Please take the time to fill that out. And this is a chance to drop that in the offering plate. Uh, I do want to remind you, there's two ways to give here in person and online, faithbaptistlakeland.com. And now I just want to go to the Lord and thank him for always providing for our needs. So let's do that now. Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for being our provider. And God, that uh, we need of nothing, Father. You always provide for our needs. And we just lift them up to you now. Uh, Father, you know each and every one of them. And God, as uh, we give a portion of what you have already given us, Father, we just ask you to bless it, stretch it, Lord, for your kingdom and your purpose. And we ask these things in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. uncertain and my weary heart can't take much more surprise I wish there was a point on the horizon something I could see with my own eyes I need to tell you that I'm scared I feel completely unprepared and nothing's what it was two weeks ago but you already know you already know everything I'm scared of everything I hope you hold my tomorrow and all tomorrow holds you already know I can't seem to find the easy answers someday I hope the suffering makes sense I just need to know that you are with me even if you keep me in suspense we talk so much these days because i have so much to say you stay and listen to me closely even though you Stand with us one more time, if you would. God of wonders. Oh, you're t- 
close this. Thank the Lord. Yes, that's right. This may be a new song for you guys. It's called Holy, Holy Forever. You may have heard it before, but I think it may be new to faith. And so I'd like to, to do that today. Before we play, there was a, a guy that I met uh, actually just yesterday. And uh, he's a fellow believer, Christian. Didn't know that until after I started talking to him. And, uh, you know, just kind of backing up what, what we've already been talking about with prayer in one of those lives, an intercessory prayer. And he, he made the statement, he's like, you know, <clears throat> I know that God's the one that saves, but God uses us. And my mom prayed for her dad for 30 years before he trusted Christ. And I was thinking about 30 years. Man, I feel like I'm praying for a long time when I pray for a month for something. And here's this, this old Korean man back in Korea. His daughter and grandsons were in the United States. And his daughter from thousands of miles away is praying night and day for her father to be saved. And he always put it off. Well, fast forward a little bit. Now he's dying. They have to go to Korea, and she's witnessing and witnessing in person, and he's not hearing it. So what does she do? She just starts reading, reading the Bible. And my friend Eric was like, what was he going to do? He couldn't get up. <laughs> so my mom just started reading the Bible. And she started noticing over the next couple of days there was a softening, and all of a sudden he started asking questions. And his daughter was like, you need Jesus in your life. And that is the only way to get to heaven. You must go through Christ. And he put his trust in God right before he died. And the next couple days afterwards, there was a difference in him. Even before death, there was a softness and she had never seen her father cry. And he started crying and weeping. And then he, he said this, and this is what really hit home for me. He said, I just wish that I would have done this years ago so that I could have done more for Christ. And instead, I've lived a selfish life and have wasted a lot. And so, from what Pastor was saying in the baptism, today's the day. Get saved now. Don't waste more time in your life. And give up all of those other blessings and all those other crowns that we would receive in heaven. Today's the day. Don't fool yourself and don't fool anybody else. Okay, so let's let's sing the song "Holy Forever." And uh, if you want to listen for a little bit before you start singing, that's fine too. But this is a beautiful song.
sing a song forever to the Lamb. And if you walk in freedom, and if you bear His name, sing a song forever to the Lamb. We'll sing a song forever and amen. The greatest your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. And the angels cry, Holy, all creation cry. Just grip your heart, amen. Our kids can be dismissed at this time for Children's Chapel if they're going to be uh, headed back for that. Uh, as they're doing that, I want to give uh, just a couple of quick announcements before the announcements uh, later on for those that will be in here. Uh, some of you have had questions, what is all the lumber, what is the construction in the back of our auditorium there? That is going to be a new addition to our sound booth. And so uh, if you have any experience with sound uh, any uh, experience working in a booth whatsoever, you will know, and all those guys unanimously will tell you, that's like a bomb shelter back there. And so we learned very quickly in this auditorium, what we hear up here is different than what you hear out here, but it's also different than what they hear in that booth. And when they're the ones helping control the sound, that can be a little bit of a problem, right? So what we're doing is constructing a new booth, uh, the sound portion what Brother Kurt has and the board in there is going to come down to the floor. The existing booth is going to remain for our video as well as our uh, computer stuff where we run the, the lyrics and slides. And so I know he didn't ask for this, but thanks, Brother Kurt. He put in a lot of time just even yesterday constructing that. And that is coming as we move into the next phase with our sound equipment. All right, another uh, announcement. I will not be here next Sunday. And so Pastor Jason, our student minister, will be bringing the message. I am going Going to be it's finally time for that missions trip to Ohio that has come about and so if you haven't heard about this let me just share uh, it's kind of weird what has happened and come about so a few months ago uh, pastor Jeff Singletary who is our regional rep for the Florida Baptist Convention reached out to all pastors in Central Florida and he said hey I want to let you know that the State Baptists of Ohio have reached out to the State Baptists of Florida and they're asking for help uh, we have a great state here to help set the example our churches are growing our baptisms are leading the nation we are seeing salvations and there are churches in Ohio that are struggling 
And so they reached out, and I got this email, and I'm already thinking, all right, that's weird. If you don't know why, I'm from Ohio. I lived 37 of my 37 years there. I'm like, this is weird, okay? Um, yeah, so I respond back, I would love to help out my state in any way. At that point, I'll go anywhere in Ohio and see what our church can do to help another church there, even if it's Cleveland, the mistake on the lake, okay? I'm from... <laughs> I'm from Cincinnati. That'll make sense to you if you know. We don't, yeah, us in Cleveland, we have quite the, the rivalry. Okay, so no, no big deal. We got all of that confirmed, and Pastor Singletary comes back in another email, and he says, okay, great, get your airfare and all these things that you need to have. The city we're targeting specifically is the city of Cincinnati. This is even more weird because I'm from Cincinnati, all right? I grew up about 30 minutes north of that, so now I'm starting to get the goosebumps, the chicken skin, right? It's happening. Well, I've, we're, we've got all plans. Everything's ready to go. Yesterday, I talked to one of the directors from the Ohio Baptist Convention, and he calls me and introduces himself, and we've got all the, the plans. We've got our itinerary set out, and he goes, would you like to preach in one of the Ohio churches on that Sunday? I said, absolutely. That would be uh, my pleasure as I look to find us a church to partner with up there. And I shared with him a little bit about my story, how, um, you know, I, I've only been a pastor since 2016, and before that I was a police officer, and I told him about the city of Monroe, which is where I was a police officer at full time for just over a decade, and he goes, well, that's funny. Would you like to preach in Monroe? I've got a church plant that's open. Would you like to preach in Monroe? Now I'm really getting goosebumps, right? This is getting really weird. I say, yeah, absolutely. What church is it? The church has went through a replant and a name change. It's the church my ministry started in. When I surrendered to preach, listen to this. I wasn't even a pastor yet. I surrendered to preach. I'm a young, dumb, third-shift cop, right? And I'm in night seminary. I'm in evening classes in seminary trying to learn a little bit about the Bible, right? But God put on my heart to start a Bible study with our police department. And so me being a Baptist, I went to our closest Baptist church. And I said, hey, could we use your auditorium for this? And they let us. And we ran that for about a year. And it grew to over 30 members in there. It was my first church. That's what I call it. It was officers. It was their wives and their children. And we ran that. And that is the very same church this time next Sunday that I will get to go preach at. And hopefully our church can form a partnership with them. How weird is that, right? That is so weird, and only God can do that. So um, I will be praying for you guys next Sunday, but please pray for me as a, a bunch of us Florida boys are headed up there to meet a lot of these Ohio pastors and just see how we can help churches that are struggling and in need, okay? All right, guys, um, this morning we are going to be continuing through our series uh, that really is going to take us through the first Sunday of July, first or second week of July. We're talking all about the family. As we discussed last week, if we think just because we're Christians, if we think just because we go to church and, and Jesus has been your Lord and Savior for a month or 45 years that we have this thing called family all figured out. We're mistaken. We're sadly mistaken. And I won't ask for a raise of hands. If we're being honest, every hand would go up. But if we said how many Christian families in here are having struggles, every hand would be raised. Because we still need the Lord. We are still sinners. And God has laid out this design of how the family is supposed to be. But because of our sin, because of our depravity, man, we screw it up, don't we? Last week we talked all about marriage. We're going to continue on that thought for the next couple of weeks as we get into more detail of that. But we, we look at the family, and then we look at priorities with relationship. And if I were to ask you, when you look at relationships in your life, what are the priorities? Well, number one, as a believer, it has to be God, right? Now, it's easy for us to say that, but we need to examine our hearts this morning. Is God your number one priority in relationship in your life? I think for us that are married, it's easy for us to say it's God, but when we look a little bit deeper, it might be our spouse. For those of us that are parents, it may be easy for us to say, yeah, it's God, he's number one. But when we look deeper, we actually find that it's our children. So the first thing first, we've got to make sure that God has that number one slot in our life of priority. But after that, it becomes our spouse. Becomes our family, right? That has to be a high priority in our life. Last week, again, we discussed our marriages. I hope that as you left last week, you were challenged in areas. Hopefully it brought up conversations with your spouse or maybe future spouse about areas that you need to tune up in. And let's work on this area and that area. Before we move on to our new topic this morning, I want to share one more thought on marriage with you. 
And, and I think this is a, a, a mistake that not just the world has made, but I think it's a mistake that now we've brought into our marriages within the church. Did you know that there is a difference between contract and covenant? Think about that. Contract and covenant. Our marriages are a covenant, but yet so often we treat them like a contract. If you have Spectrum Internet at your house, you're in a contract with Spectrum Internet. You'd say, yeah, I know. Thanks for reminding me, right? Whatever company you're with, you're in a contract with them. A contract says, as long as you're providing this service to me, then I'm going to pay you this monthly fee, right? And church, if Spectrum turns your internet off, are you going to continue to pay them? Oh, really? I'm not. I'm not. I'll be the one guy. I'm not paying them. No. Why wouldn't we continue to pay Spectrum? Because they're not providing that service to you anymore, right? When we go into a covenant, we're making a promise with our spouse and with God. Now, if your spouse isn't providing a service for you that they thought you were going to provide, do we just break the contract and leave? No, but how many times do we see in life? Yeah. Why? Because we're treating our marriages like a contract and not like a covenant. Let me give you a few more differences. Contract says that we believe we came together to make each other happy. So the purpose that you're here in my life is to make me happy. And if you're not making me happy, then this thing ain't going to work. That's what contract says. Covenant says that we believe God brought us together for his purpose. That it's beyond our happiness and me and you that God brought us together because he's got purposes for us in our marriage. Contract says I'm going to receive my spouse as long as they live up to their expectations. As long as you're doing what you're supposed to do, as long as you're giving me what I need to have, then we're going to be fine and it's hunky-dory. But if not, this thing ain't going to work. That's contract. Covenant says, even with all my spouse's imperfections, how many of you got spouses that have imperfections? Okay, we got a few hands. The rest of you are lying. <laughs> even through all their imperfections, I'm still going to receive them. I'm still going to love them. Don't forget, you have imperfections too. Amen? Contract says, just in case something goes wrong, I want a loophole out of this thing. Just in case this doesn't work out, I want to be able to back out of my contract. That's contract. Covenant says that I'm leaving the security of my family. I'm leaving the security of my past relationships. Contract says that we'll cleave to each other as long as we continue to feel love for one another. But boy, if that love fades. Boy, if I just don't feel those rainbow and unicorny things about you that I used to feel, well, then this contract's probably over. That's contract. Covenant says that we will cleave to each other until death do us part. Contract says that sex is fuel for our love. As long as that's happening, I've got fuel, we're going to be fine. But if it's not, well, then this is over. Covenant says that sex is an expression of our covenant. It's a picture of what God created in the marriage for a man and a woman. We are not in a contract in our marriages, church. We are in a covenant. And you're not just in a covenant with your spouse. You're in a covenant with Almighty God. Now, marriage is an amazing covenant. It's an amazing covenant to enter into. But let me tell you, when you enter into that covenant, if you've been married any amount of time, you know this already, that there is a lot of responsibility that comes with it. Amen? You would know that as we enter into the marriage covenant, the husband and the wife, a major part of making this work is you have got to understand your role within that marriage. A lot of our marriages in church and outside of church today are not working and they're falling apart. Why? Because the husband and the wife do not know their biblical roles. We don't have to figure this out. It's not, well, it's just different for every marriage. Yours looks like this. No, no, no. God's already defined it. That's what we're going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks. And when we identify our roles, our marriage will be helped. You can't identify your role because of what you've been told by somebody else. Well, this is what you need to do. And this is what the man's got to do. And this is what the woman's got to do. And this is how it's got to be. We don't do that. We don't define roles even necessarily by how our marriage has been for the last 10, 20, 30 years. 
we define our roles as husband and wife in marriage by what God says. Because this is the authority and nothing else matters. What I want to do this morning, and we're going to split this up into two messages. We're going to have a message on the wife, and this morning I want to focus on a message for the husbands. The role of the husband. My prayer in here for each man, each husband, maybe you desire to be a husband one day, is that you would take your role seriously. That this wouldn't be a game to you. This wouldn't be frivolous to you. Remember, your role that you and I have today as husbands, speaking to the men, is not given to us by our dads. It's not given to us by our granddads. This role has been given to us by Almighty God. And I see elbows from the wives to the men right now. You better be listening. I tell you, you better listen up today. Are you listening to what he says? We're going to chat about this later. Ladies, don't get too excited because your sermon's coming next. But let's talk about for the guys today. And ladies, please don't disconnect yourself because I think that this will be a great day to help all of your marriages. I want you to grab your Bibles this morning and turn to Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. A very popular passage on the husband. Ephesians chapter 5, when you get there, I'll direct your attention to verse 25. If you're able to stand with us this morning, we do that here just to show honor and respect to the reading of God's word. If you've got a bad back or bad legs, you don't do well standing, that's okay. You can stay seated. There's no shame in that. We're going to open this morning again in Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 25. Husbands, let's all take a big deep breath together. Get ready. All right, here we go. We're going to be all right. We're going to make it. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Oh, there's already a dagger in our heart, isn't there? All right, verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Look at verse 29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Father, I ask that you'll be with me as we go through your holy, inerrant, infallible word. God, we thank you that we have this book of truth. It's the only thing that has absolute truth in our life, Lord, and we need it desperately. Lord, I pray for the marriages in this room today that will face some hard things. Lord, I pray for the men specifically in this room today who don this title and this role of husband. Father, I pray for all of us in this role that have failed so miserably, maybe even up to this point today, that we would be man enough and bold enough to confess it, repent of our failure before our wife and before you. And God, that today you would already begin healing our marriage as we leave this, this auditorium. Lord, we thank you for giving us direction on this. We thank you for defining our roles. Lord, I pray not just for the husbands, I pray for the wives as well, Lord, that we would come together in unity and unison and that we would have God-centered marriages. We thank you for your word. Bless us with it. Speak with us today. Help us to be real. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. That was a little hard passage to read, would you agree? I heard some of you out there be like, "Woo, uh, okay, twist that dagger a little bit more, Pastor. Let's throw some salt in there while you're at it, right? That's tough, man. Are you with me? That's tough. And that's what we are called to do as a husband. Did you catch what that passage said? We are called to love our, our wife like Jesus loved the church. You say, well, I love church. You don't love the church like Jesus loved the church. How much did Jesus love the church? He gave his life for it. Do you love your wife enough that you would give your life for her? What about that whole section, too, there about taking care of her as I would take care of my own body? Man, that goes against my flesh, doesn't it? Because let me tell you, when Pastor Drew can eat, is hungry, and I like to eat. I eat. I get myself some food, right? I got a good cook, too. When Pastor Drew is sleepy, guess what I do? I go to bed, and I get some rest. When Pastor Drew wants some R&R, guess what? I go get some R&R time. Because when I'm single, it's all about me. But now that I've donned the role of a husband, God's really throwing my world in a whirlwind here. 
Because he's saying, yeah, all those things that you used to do because you were number one, now your wife's going to be number one. All those things that you were going to have to do to take care of yourself, now she comes before you. I think the Bible talks a little bit about that, doesn't it? When it talks about preferring one another, your wife being at the top. This morning I want to give you five ways, men, that you can love your wife. Five ways that you can love your wife. The number one way that you can love your wife, if you're taking notes, point number one, you can love your wife by following Jesus. Love your wife by following Jesus. Hold your place in Ephesians. We are going to come back here, but will you turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 24. Jesus speaking here in Matthew 16, 24, it says, Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, in order for you to be a good husband, in order for you to be a true follower of Jesus Christ, we got to give up some things, don't we? Amen? We've got to give up some things. We've got to sacrifice. Drew can't be number one anymore, especially if I'm going to be a follower of Jesus. But it's also true with my wife. I've got to give up needs and wants in my own life to make sure that she comes first. And we've got to get that down. Do we got to be perfect at it? No. Maybe you're here as a husband and you would say, but I stink at that. I'm terrible. I acknowledge that I am a selfish person, and it causes problems with me and my wife. We talk about it all the time. I'm really, really struggling it. Listen, Pastor, I can't be perfect in this area. I got good news for you, and I got good news for me today. If you'll listen to this next statement, I think it'll really help you. It's not about being a perfect man. It's about following a perfect man. It's not about you being a perfect man. You can't do it. It's about you following a perfect man. I would venture to say there's a lot of men in this room that are like me this morning. And we try to be everything for everybody all the time. Right? Is there anybody like that? Like the Bible says, try to be all things for all men. That's what we try to do. I don't want to let anybody down. If somebody has a need, I'm going to be there. If somebody wants to chat, we're going to chat. If somebody uh, just needs me for anything in my home, in my friendship, I'm going to do what I can to be there. But here's what we got to understand this morning, men, is that while so many of us get caught up in trying to be everything for everyone with no mistakes all the time, we cannot do it. We can't do it because we beat ourselves up when we let people down, don't we? We beat ourselves up when I just couldn't go the extra mile that time. But we've got to understand in our humanity, God hasn't designed us to do that. God hasn't called us to be like that. God has not called us as men to be all things for everyone, everywhere, all the time in perfection. You say, what has Jesus called me to do? He's called us to follow him. That's our call. We're called to follow Jesus with everything that we have. And you know an amazing thing happens? When a man, when a dad, when a husband follows Jesus, we start to become more like him. It's the formula. Stop trying to be everything for everybody. Follow Jesus and he'll take care of the rest. How do I have that power? He'll give it to you. That's amazing. When you follow Jesus, he will give you the power to be like him. But you have got to depend on the Holy Spirit to do it. We as men have got to stop trying to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. We're strong enough. The governor, right? We're strong enough. We can do it. I'm smart enough. I'm just, I'm just going to, I'm famous for saying this. I've heard some of you guys say this in here today too. I'm, we're going to make it happen. We'll say, I don't know how. I don't know where I'm going to find the time. I don't know where I'm going to find the money. I don't know where I'm going to find the ability but we're going to make it happen. We have got to stop being the governor, okay? We have got to depend on Almighty God. When we depend on the Spirit, we won't fail because the Spirit doesn't know defeat. Now, I think you're like me as well. I don't like to fail. I don't like to be rejected. 
I don't like to look silly. I have a male ego, just like the rest of y'all do. And it doesn't feel good when those things come. As a matter of fact, I take it pretty hard. But you know when I'm sitting in that and I'm upset at myself, or I am just uh, being a baby, I guess would be the best way to describe it, in my situation, do you know what I realize? Well, I've been doing all this in my own strength. I'm mad at myself because I couldn't be the Terminator. I couldn't be Superman. That was all things for all men. And here I am upset at myself. Wow, Drew, knocking on wood, you were trying to do it on your own strength. God hasn't called us to do it in our own strength, guys. He's called us to depend on him. And you know, when we as men will depend on the Holy Spirit, do you know what comes with that? Peace. When we as men will depend on the Holy Spirit, do you know what comes with that? Strength. Strength like never before. You think you're strong now without Christ. Imagine how strong you're going to be with Christ. It's an amazing, beautiful thing. We'll love our wife by following Jesus. Number two, we will love our wife by submitting to God's role in your family. Love your wife by submitting to God's role in your family. I want you to focus on a word there. It's a big, ugly S word in the churches. If I had a little laser pointer, I'd circle it. But it's called submitting, submitting. Boy, sometimes we like to throw that word in our wife's face, don't we? Now, honey, just remind you, just remind you, I didn't write it. God wrote it. But you need to submit. Honey, let me just remind you, I know, I know, I know, I know. But you need to submit, which means I'm the dictator and you're going to do whatever I say, and if you don't do what I'm going to say, we'll probably just kick you out of the church, and you're going to have problems, and you're going to have to sleep on the couch tonight. you got to submit, right? None of you have ever said that in here. Praise the Lord. I'm so, so excited for that. But we're quick to throw that in our wife's face, aren't we? You better submit. The Bible says, wives, you need to submit to our husband. Uh, let's remind ourselves of something, men. We are called to submit as well. We are called to submit to Almighty God. And let us remind each other of this today. God created a husband and wife in the marriage with equal value. We have unique responsibilities, but we have equal value in the marriage. God created woman in Genesis chapter 2 from the rib of Adam, verse 18. He created the wife as, wife as the Bible describes her as a help meet. Uh, that's, a, that's a helper. If you have a good helper by your side today, praise God for that. Amen? This is where you get brownie points, man. Wake up. Come on. Say amen if you have a wife. Okay. thank. I'm trying to help you, but y'all are deadhead Baptists this morning. Amen. We've got a good helper. But God's designed the family. Do you agree with that? We don't get to redesign that. We don't get to pick what happens. God's designed the family. So we have a husband. We have a wife who was created to be a helper. Go back to Ephesians chapter 5, and God gives us a very clear verse in verse number 23. Here's how the, 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 the family is structured in verse 23. He says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now, here's what we know from that verse, is that the husband is the head of the wife. That word head in the Greek, it means prominent. It means leader. It means chief. It means you are the head of that family. Hear me, men. It does not mean that you get to be Fidel Castro and be a dictator. It does not mean that you get to be a dominator. It does not mean that she is under your shoe and she has to obey and follow you in every area of your life. Because chances are, if that's how you act, you're living in sin. And when you're living in sin, she don't have to listen to a word you say. Yet we see the husband is the head of the wife. Now let me bring our, our ladies in on this for just a minute. Let me bring our wives in. Ladies, hear me. I love you. Your men will never say this to you, so I'm going to say it. I'll take the heat. You've got to let your husbands lead your family. You have got to let your husbands lead your family. I know this speaks in the face of modern-day feminism. I know this speaks in the face of our independent ladies in here. And I know because I'm married to one. 
But listen to me, ladies. Do you want to help your marriage? You have got to take a step back. And you've got to let your husbands lead the family. God has only ordained one head in that family. He has not ordained two heads. Do you know what I learned long ago? Is that if there's anything in life that has two heads on it, you probably ought to kill it. (laughs) Don't let that be your marriage. Ladies, I love you. We couldn't live without you. But God hasn't called you to lead your family. God's called your husband to lead your family. Now, men, hear me this morning. Being the leader doesn't mean that your wife is inferior to you. It doesn't mean that your wife is less than than you, that God loves you more than he loves you. It doesn't mean that her identity is less than your identity. Here's another one. Let's keep going while we're on this. It doesn't mean that she needs to blindly obey you. It doesn't mean that she needs to submit to you mistreating her in your marriage. And let me tell you, if you're mistreating your wife and it gets back to me, I'm going to tell you and i got a big problem right now. You're not going to mistreat God's gift that he gave you in your life. And they don't have to follow you through that. But she needs to submit. She needs to follow me. She needs to to obey. What you've got to understand is that submission does not mean that your wife has to follow you into your sin. Or that she has no voice in your marriage. As a matter of fact, if you're in sin, man, your wife has has an absolute right to not listen to you. I've run into situations uh, in ministry where there's been a husband and wife and they're at odds and she comes to me and she goes, I just don't know what to do. He doesn't want me to go to church. He tells me I'm not allowed to go to church. And it's not that there's a personal problem at the church. I'm just not allowed to go to church. We're just not going to church anymore. What do I do? I say, you got to honor God before you honor your husband. You get up and you go to church. And man, if that's how you are, shame on you. Shame on you. We have got to lead our wives in a godly way. And remember this, that there's no such thing as submission without a willing spirit. So you can't force this thing of submission. We have got to prove that we're worthy to be followed by the example that we lead and live in the Lord. And then our wives will willingly follow. And if not, well then that's what we'll talk about in the next week. I'm just kidding. When we talk about leading, and we understand the heavy burden that comes with that, that's heavy, man. That's heavy because we're leading our wives, we're leading our children, we're leading a, a family. What does leading mean? Here it is, you ready? It means that we have got to submit to God's leadership. True leadership is not you trying to figure this out and you're going to plow your way through. A true godly leader follows the leadership of God. We have got to step up in our families and lead. What is killing the church of Jesus Christ in 2024 is passive Christian men. They will not lead in the church. They will not lead in a ministry. They will not step up in any area. And they are surely not stepping up and leading in their homes. Men, it is time for us to buck up and lead like God has called us to lead. But I don't know what to do what to say. Listen, do you trust God? You trusted God for your salvation, right? You believe in someone you cannot see, but through your faith, you believe that he has saved your soul and sealed you for all eternity. Do you trust that God did that? Yeah. Do you believe that God has enough power because he can save you, right? Do you believe that God has enough power that he'll teach you how to lead your family? Trust him. Follow him. That's what our faith as men is all about. Following God will provide and he'll teach you. Leadership means that we'll sacrificially serve our wife like Jesus served the church. So many of us, we are selfish in our marriages. It's all about me. It's all about what I want. Remember what our Lord and Savior said. He said, I didn't come to be served. He said, I came to serve. That's got to be our attitude and our spirit in our marriages with our wife. And that you will seek unity with your wife on decisions that have to be made in your family. Direction that your family is going to go. Listen, men, listen, listen. It is not our way or the highway. It's not our way or the highway. Well, I'm the man. I'm putting it down. Stroke my ego a little bit now, right? This is the decision. And if you don't like it, well, there's the door. What is that? That's the world 
That's what that is. It's not our way or the highway. You are to come together in unity with your wife. Why? Because that's what a godly head does. That's what a godly leader does. All right, pastor, I need to serve my wife. How can I do that? Is that like breakfast in bed? Is that like foot massages on demand? Uh, well, what is that? Let me give you some ways that you can serve your wife. Number one, know her needs. Know her needs. Do you know what your wife needs? When's the last time that you had an honest conversation about that? Honey, what do you need? What are you lacking in this marriage? What, what, where's an area that I can step up and help you in? That's a great conversation to have, even though it's hard. But you got to know your needs. You can't fill her needs if you don't know her needs. Don't assume, men, don't assume you know your wife. That's stupid. Amen? All right. Here's another way you can serve your wife. Be the leader on handling conflict. When there's conflict in your marriage, don't be a baby and go to your room and turn on your Xbox. When there's conflict in your home, don't expect your wife, well, she's going to be the one to come to me. Grow up. You be the leader. You say, honey, we're having a disagreement. I know your heart's grieved. My heart is grieved. Understanding, there may be some time we need to think about this, but you need to take the initiative and say, let's solve this problem together. Let's go to God's word and see what God would say about coming together on this conflict together. We are to be the leader on that as the husband. We can also serve our wife by stepping up with our finances. Don't just say, well, she's just, I just don't want to deal with the money. That's on her. That's not leading. Now, I'm not saying that you got to be 100% the leader and she can't have any part, but for you to just dump all of that off and say, I'm not dealing with it, you handle your finances, that is not godly leading. The scripture will never teach that. We need to step up with our family finances. We need to lead in our spiritual growth. Some of our husbands in here, your wife is the spiritual leader in your home. That was my home for quite a few years. I had to grow. My prayer is, is that you're growing. And one day, God's going to grow you to the point where you're able to take on that spiritual role. But some of you in here, you don't give a flip. You say, I don't care. She does all the church stuff. She does all the Bible reading. She does all the prayer. What a shame. What a shame. We, as godly men, are called to be the spiritual leader in our home. I'm the one ought to be initiating prayer with my children. I'm the one that ought to be initiating Bible study with my children. That ought to be me. We need to be present. Don't be gone all the time. I don't care if it's work or playtime. You need to be home. That serves your wife. And we need to build trust with our wife. Those are just some ways that you can serve her today. And I promise you, you do those things, you'll have a leg up in your marriage. I promise you. Number three, third way we can love our wife. We can love our wife by nurturing and cherishing her. Nurturing and cherishing her. Go back to chapter 5, Ephesians 5 again. And I want to reread verses 28 and 29. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. I want you to look at those two words that are in those verses. And they're in that point right there. Nurture and cherish. Nurture and cherish. Put that point back up. Nurture and cherish. What does that mean? What does that mean to nurture and cherish. Because if you don't understand those two words, you are not going to get any of this whole verse. Let me tell you what it means to nurture and cherish. It means to treat her gently and supply her needs. Treat her gently and supply her needs. Oh, man. How do we do that? Oh, man, Pastor. I need your help on this one. Good. I got some help for you. Here it comes. Some ways we can do this. Six ways. Number one, we can die to ourself. For me to nurture and nourisheth and cherish my wife, I can die to myself. Like we talked about in the beginning, I can put her needs before mine. Man, I really wanted to do this, but this would be a blessing to my wife. Man, I really want to do this, but she has been working and slaving, and sometimes I get home, and with the babies all around, she's got poop smeared on her face, like her hair is just crazy, like she looks like she's been in World War III. I could go out with the guys tonight, but you know what? She needs a spa day. That would be part of you sacrificing your needs for her. Do our wives deserve that? Here's where you can get brownie points. 
Amen. Okay, cool, man, you all are slow in here today. I'm, I've got an open calendar this week for counseling, ladies, if we need. We can die to ourselves. The second one is this. We can step into our wife's world. That's what I mean by that. Do you have any idea what your wife goes through during the day? See, it's easy for us. We go off to work, and we work hard. I'm not discounting that. We work hard. But do you have any idea what your wife goes through during the day? Those that are in my stage of life, you couldn't pay me six figures to do that job. She is homeschooling. She is wiping rear ends. She's cleaning up puke. She's breaking up fights. She's fixing boo-boos and just, I mean, it's just chaos all day long. But if you never tap into your wife's world and you have no idea what she's going through, you're going to come home and say, well, you're just a stay-at-home mom. You got it easy. <laughs> oh, my goodness. When is the last time that you asked your wife what she goes through? How is your day? What was difficult about your day today? What can I help you with? Step into her world, man. Step into her world. That is nurturing and cherishing her. Number three, show her and tell her that you love her. Well, duh. No, no, no. Seriously, men, we assume all the time. Well, of course my wife loves me. When's the last time you showed her that? Well, I mean, I, I just I, I haven't. I just, I just know that she does. I mean, we're together, and, 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 and she sleeps in the same bed with me, and I, I just know that she loves me. No, no, no. When's the last time you've shown her that you've loved her? Here's an even more basic one. When's the last time you've told her that you loved her? What a shame. Some of us, it's been a long time time since we've even just looked at our wife and said, honey, I love you. That's nurturing and cherishing her. The next one, number four, pray with her. Pray with her. This goes back to you being the spiritual leader. This comes back to you initiating. Chances are you initiated the relationship, right? Command and conquer, and you did. You got a ring on that finger. Good job. Don't let that stop. By you coming alongside, you're stepping into her world. You're saying, hey, how was your day? What was hard? How can I pray for you today? And then you lead her in a world of prayer. That is powerful for your wife. Pray for her. Pray with her. Number five, here's a fifth one that we can do. Be faithful. Be faithful. Don't go out and have a physical relationship. That's easy, right? But let me take it one step further. Guard your eyes. Men, guard your your eyes. We're going to be talking about this heavily next Friday at our men's conference, and I hope that you're there. But we are going to be talking about purity. We have got to be men of purity. It is not just disrespectful, but it is a break of our covenant with our wife and God when we have eyes for other women. I don't care if it's at church. I don't care if it's down the street. I don't care if it's at work. I don't care if it's at the grocery store. We're called to have eyes for one woman. Guard your eyes. And do you know by doing that, you're nurturing and you're cherishing your wife. And the sixth one is this. Never mistreat her in any way. Never mistreat her in any way. The best example I heard on this was a pastor that I love to follow. His name is Dr. Mac Brunson. And Mac Brunson used to be the senior pastor of Baptist Church of Jacksonville, Florida. He's no longer there. Um, he's pastoring in Alabama now. But he did a sermon on this topic one time. And he used the illustration of a cast iron skillet. How many of you in here got a cast iron skillet? A lot of us do, right? How many of you love that cast iron skillet? It's amazing. We, we lost ours when we moved down here. The, one of the first things we did, no joke, we moved in, got settled, we went out and got a cast iron skillet. That thing is amazing. I mean, food has never tasted better than when it comes out of a cast iron skillet. You can cook anything with it. Let me tell you, you can hammer nails with that cast iron skillet if you need to do it, right? The cast iron skillet, it's durable, right? It's kind of like that Terminator we talked about. You could throw that thing on the ground. You could kick it. You could shoot it. That cast iron skillet is still going to be there. We bang that dude around. We're not worried about it, right? We're rough with our cast iron skillet. But then some of us in our homes, we have a hutch or a cabinet in the corner, and it's full of fine china. How many of you have fine china? Maybe in a box somewhere. All right, not many. But you know what I'm talking about. Fine china. Delicate. Beautiful. Pristine. Can I ask us just a basic question this morning? How many of you would treat your fine china the exact same way that you would your cast iron skillet? 
we wouldn't. Yet some of us as men, we're treating our wives like a cast iron skillet. We talk them around. You may throw them around. You may mistreat them. You are harsh. You are dirty. Let me, let me explain something, men. Our wives are not cast iron skillets. They're fine china. They are a gift from God. And some of us need to be knocked off our block in our high horse this morning. And we need to wake up and smell the coffee. And stop treating our wives like cast iron skillets. And start treating them like fine china. Amen, amen, amen. And men that can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. Number four, we're almost done. You can love your wife by being a student of her. Love your wife by being a student of her. Turn to one more passage with me this morning. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. This ought to convict the daylights out of our heart this morning. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. Catch this. Do not miss this part. That your prayers be not hindered. All of us have serious prayer requests, but notice this verse is directed towards us men. It's directed towards us as husbands. That if we are not going to give honor unto our wife and we are not going to treat her as she deserves to be treated as a daughter of God, that there's a consequence for that, that our prayers could be hindered. And I have serious things in my life that I need God to, to move in. I have serious uh, requests and prayers in my life that I need God to speak and I need God to answer. But to know that the fact that I may disrespect my wife could hinder my prayers, this is serious, men. If you need one reason, just one reason, why you ought to be a respectful husband that loves and gives honors unto his wife, it's so that God will hear and answer your prayers. And we need to know our wives. Do you know your wife? Do you know your wife? What does she think about? What does she love? What are her gifts? What are her abilities? What are her dreams? Do you even know what dreams that she has? How does she feel love? How does she receive love? What bothers her? We may know the answer to that one. What bothers her? When there's conflict in the marriage, how does she want to resolve conflict? Here's an important one. How does she want to follow God with you? How does she want to follow God with you? The only way we're going to know our wives, let me tell you, it takes time to do this, and it takes meaningful conversation. You will never get to know your wives by getting with them with the scrap time that you have left over in your day. Men, hear me this morning. You've got to be intentional on this. We've got to intentionally have a goal that I'm going to carve out me time, this thing, whatever it is, and I'm going to sit down and I'm going to talk to my wife because I want to get to know her. It's not going to be the leftovers at the end of the day. And lastly, this morning, number five. This is a long one, so I'll read it a couple times. You can love your wife by partnering together to build a God-centered family. Love your wife by partnering together to build a God-centered family. I want you to think about this for just a moment. What do you want your legacy to be? What do you want your legacy to be? When you are dead and gone, and there are generations are still here after you. What do you want your legacy to be? I think all of us would have some of the same answers. I want to be remembered as an upstanding Christian. I want to be remembered as a great dad. I want to be remembered as a great grandfather. I want to be remembered as a good husband. What do you want your legacy to become? Then let me tell you, that's what you need to become. See, some of us in here now, that would be our legacy. I want to be remembered as one of the greatest dads in all the world. I want to be remembered as one of the greatest husbands in all the world. But we're not living it right now. You're not going to be remembered that way. How do you want to be remembered? Live that now. Some of you in here come from broken marriages and generations before you. You say, my mom and dad were a horrible example. It was chaos. I, I deal with scars to that today. 
My, my grandma and grandpa were horrible, and then I saw my parents continue that chain. Listen, your legacy is what? I want to show my parents, a hel- or my children, a healthy marriage where they see a mom and dad that love each other, that stay together, that worship God, that serve God, but you're not living it now. Now's the time to live it. Become God-centered now, and you'll have that legacy. Don't think it's something you can throw together in your 60s or your 70s. Those in their 20s and their 30s and their 40s, we have got to become our legacy now. How do we do that? We work with our wife. We work with our wife to create an environment to help God shape these children's heart. Partner with your wife today to raise these kids, raise these grandkids, whatever the children relationship is in your life. So, but Pastor, you don't get it. There's times I just don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. When those times hit you and you don't know what to say, you don't know what to do, you have got to go to the Word of God and you have got to get on your knees before Him. You've got to beg God. Say, God, I don't know. I'm at the end of my rope. God, I have no words. I have no actions. I don't know what to do. God, I want you to help me. I need you to help me. He'll help you. Let God mold you as a man. Let God mold you as a father, not this world. Let God mold you as a husband. Allow God to work through your sins and your failures to create this godly household where for generations to come, don't you want this? Where for generations to come, the children and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren will stand up and say, praise God for that godly marriage. Praise God for godly parents. Praise God for godly grandparents and aunts and uncles and those in my life who have helped us to see and set this example. Thank you, Jesus, for that precious marriage. Don't you want that? Then we have got to become that through the help of Almighty God. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, yeah, man, I want that. I want that. I want to change. Maybe you'd be here and you'd say, I'm a rotten husband. I don't treat my wife well. I'm not a good dad, and I'm not a godly man, and I want to change, and I've tried this, and I've tried that, but here I am, and I'm not getting anywhere. It's because you're missing the point. Listen to me, man. Every male eyeball on me right now. You will never change without Jesus. You will never, ever change without Jesus. You can try every how-to book in the world, but until you do this book, and you change with the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to be flat on your face. Remember, it's not about you being a perfect man. It's about you following a perfect man. Let me ask you this morning, husbands, are you sick of it? Are you tired of the failure? Are you tired of feeling like you're a gerbil running on that cage that just keeps going, that wheel that just keeps going? Are you ready for change today? And are you ready for healing in your own life? Are you ready for healing in your marriage? Are you ready for joy? True, everlasting joy in your marriage. I'll close with this. There was a study that was done on lost families some years ago. And what I mean by lost families, these are families where there is no Christ at all. It doesn't matter if the family is a husband and wife and one kid or 20 kids. Not a single person in this household is saved. Here's what they found in the study. If you've got this lost family and one of the children are the very first ones to come to Christ, there's a 17% chance that the rest of the family will follow Christ, okay? So if one of the kids come before the mom and dad, there's a 17% chance that the rest of that family will go and follow Christ. If you have a lost family and the mother is the very first one saved in that family, then you have a 31% chance that the rest of the family would follow Christ. But if that daddy was saved first, if that husband was saved first, if that man was the first one born again in that family, there's a 91% chance that the rest of the family would follow Christ. Do you know why, guys? Because God built the family to follow you. He built the family to follow me. Let me ask you, will you trust Christ today? You may be a man here, and maybe you're like Emma, but you're just much older. 
You say, I don't know that I'm truly saved. I've made a profession. I don't know that I'm truly saved. I'm begging you to trust Christ today. Maybe you're a man and you don't go to church. You're just here for whatever reason today. And maybe this message is gripping you. And you say, I've, I've never claimed Jesus in my life. Listen, I'm pleading with you. Will you trust Jesus today? You don't have to figure all this out on your own. You don't have to pave your own way. You don't have to rewrite your family. God has everything you need to know. It's already set. You're called to trust Christ. The Christian husband's in here. We know we screw up. We know we're failures. But let me ask you, are you ready to get your marriage back on track? Aren't you sick of living the way that it's been? Aren't you ready to have that joy that you used to have? Aren't you ready to have that unity back and that harmony and that love back that used to be there, but now for whatever reason, it's gone? Let me tell you what we're going to do here in just a moment. So we're going to get real with God. And we're going to get honest with God. And we're going to confess in our hearts what's going on. And I can't force you to do this. But when we pray, I want you today to stop faking. I want you to stop putting on a mask. Because let me tell you, you can fake out everybody. You are not faking out God. And I don't know the state of your marriage, but some of our marriages are not honoring God. Our marriages need to be a living testament of Jesus Christ in the church. And for the Christians in here, it's time to get those marriages back on track. It's time to confess our hearts before him. It's time to confess our hearts to our wives. And can I tell you why we do that? Because there's joy that's waiting beyond that confession. Man, there's love that you haven't felt in a long time waiting beyond that confession. Today's the day to bring that all back in together. You know what God's waiting on? He's waiting on you. He's waiting on you and he's waiting on me to quit playing games, to quit acting like babies, to grow up and be the man that God's called us to be. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one looking around, so our musicians will come forward. In just a minute, as the men begin playing, I'm going to ask for men who feel this call to come to the front. And I'm going to ask you to get on your knees and I don't care if you feel embarrassed. I, feel, I get it. I get it. But this is our time with God. And we've got to get serious about our husbandship with God. In just a minute, I'm going to ask our husbands and our men who feel called to do so to come forward and get on our knees and pray in the front. I, I'm going to ask wives in this room who love your husbands enough to come up beside them and pray over your husband. Women, if you've never prayed over your husband, we need that in our life as well to come across and say, Lord, help my husband who I love so dearly to be this man that he needs to be. Help him to be strong in these times of peril, in these times of hardship. I know what a burden he has. Lord, help me to be the help me that you've called me to be with him. Listen to me. Our married couples across this room today, are you bold enough to say, I need more. I need more. I need God. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord, as we turn this over to you. I ask this morning that you'll give us hearts of boldness. Help us not to care what anyone thinks around us, but we need to get our life right with you, our marriages right with you today. Help our men be men that aren't men of the world, but we're men of you. Stand up for truth. Cast out sin. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand with me where you're at in your seats, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No eyeballs looking around. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm going to ask you, men, if you feel called, come to the front and let's pray. Wives, if you want to pray with your husband, you come too. Grab him by the arm. Say, honey, I want to pray with you. I want to pray over you. I want God to help you. We're not going to be weak, passive men this morning. It's time that we stand up and be men of God, not men of the world. God, help us. Listen, if you call him and you ask him, he'll hear you. Maybe today we've got some things to confess because our prayers have been hindered. God, don't hinder my prayers. Help me, God. Forgive me. Forgive me of my sin against my spouse. Forgive me of my sin against you. Forgive me of my sin in life, Lord. Hear me and help me. I need you. You pray that today. Let our marriages be God-honoring. Let our marriages be fulfilled. All around the room, people are praying. 
God, meet us where we are today. God, don't leave me where I'm at. God, we used to have such love, and now we're so far apart, and we're so distant. Bring us together. Men, ask your wives to forgive you. Ask God to forgive you. And then you can come up from this altar knowing that you are forgiven. So many still praying. Heads are still bowed. Eyes are still closed. We don't need music for the Holy Spirit to work. Let him work in your heart this morning. I challenge you if you're in your pew this morning and you're wrestling with this. Should I step out? I don't know if I want to. What are people going to think? Listen, you've got to just submit to God. Submit to God. Don't carry these burdens home with you today. Don't take these things home with you. You can lay them at his feet. He'll take it. He's big enough to take it. Help Faith Baptist Church to be a church of strong men. You may be seated there in your seats. Thank you all for hanging around. I want to get you just some quick announcements. We've got one more baptism, and then we'll be um, out the door as they're getting ready for that baptism. Um, on your way out, and you know what? I had one, and I laid it down. There is a handout on that table out there that came this week from the Florida Baptist Convention. And for those of you that give to missions, our church monthly supports the Florida Baptist Convention and the missions that go along with that. If you're wondering, where is that money going every week? I want you to grab that pamphlet out there, and it gives in great detail where that money is going and some of the decisions and uh, just the progress that the convention has been making this year. And we're thankful to be able to support them with that. As I mentioned earlier, we have next weekend two conferences coming up that I'm excited about, and uh, just it's going to be great, and God's going to move. So next Friday, April 26th, we're having our first ever Men of Faith Men's Conference, and so that is next Friday night, 5.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m., so we're asking $10 for you to register. That includes a very yummy barbecue dinner that we're going to have here for the guys, and then we're going to come in here, and you're going to have a couple messages and time of worship, and we're going to be uh, just dealing with some things where we can get right with God, just going along with our message today. Pastor Mark Bishop 
from Grace Point Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky, will be here uh, that day. I'm excited. That's Friday, April 26th. The very next day, Saturday, April 27th, is our Women of Faith Conference. Their title of their message or their um, uh, conference this year theme is The Quest for Contentment. How to find contentment in the Lord in every age of life. They're meeting on April 27th, beginning at 9.30 a.m. until 1.30 p.m. We're also asking $10 for that. That includes your lunch um, as well. And we're asking that when you register for those websites, you can scan the QR code on those flyers. We have flyers available also out in the lobby. And that'll take you to um, a third-party website, Tithely, where you can register very easily for that. We would love to see you guys. Any questions on that, see me after the service. We have an outreach coming up on Saturday, May 11th. So that is the day before Mother's Day. Saturday, May 11th, this is an outreach effort that we're going to help one more child, formerly known as the Florida Baptist Children's Homes. One of the things that the children's homes do is they collect food. They have food drives to help these, uh, fa- a lot of these fatherless homes or these orphan homes with food so that these children um, are able to eat. And so they have been collecting food over the last few weeks through the local post office. What we're going to do that day is we as a church, those who can, we're going to go to the post office, which is where we will meet. Uh, I believe it's the one down on Lakeland Hills Boulevard, our main one down there by the baseball stadium. And we're going to help sort and get those uh, sorted into categories, and then we're going to help them load trucks. And so there's not a ton. If you can't do lifting, that's okay. You can help us sort. There's something for everyone to do. We're going to have two shifts to do this, and and the only way we can have two shifts is because we we have to have people jump on board. Otherwise, we've signed up for four hours. So I'm asking that day, Saturday, May 11th, we're going to have a shift from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., so two hours. You can sign up for that one. Or the second shift will be from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Or if you're a real go-getter, you can just sign up for both. But please sign up for that out in the lobby. Um, We need to fill that up and get some names. Again, that is Saturday, uh, May 11th. All right. And uh, just a reminder again, I will not be here preaching next week. We'll pick up uh, as soon as I'm back on our series on Family First. But our student pastor, Brother Jason Leggett, will be preaching for you. And speaking of Brother Jason... Him and he can come on in, and we thought this was cool because he has the privilege of being able to baptize his own son today. And so, uh, Brother Jason, go ahead. Okay, so this is my son, Liam. (laughs) Yep, and... uh, as uh, I mentioned uh, just a couple weeks ago uh, in excitement, I said, you know, there's no greater joy as a youth pastor than to be able to see youth come to Christ. Uh, that was with Brother Devin. And uh, as a father, there's no greater joy than to see a child come to Christ. And uh, so Liam came to me about a month ago. And he told me, he said, Dad, you know... I- I really can't remember anything about my salvation. And he says, I'm struggling with that because I I don't know how to give a testimony that I can't even recall. And Liam, like so many others, like uh, Emma even uh, in this morning's uh, baptism, had mentioned Liam, too, had made a statement of faith at five years old. But it was working on his heart. God was really convicting him recently that he realized that that was just words. That wasn't truly Uh, an actual calling that God had on his life and that he would uh, come to Jesus outside of just a father uh, praying a prayer with him. And some of you in there uh, might be facing the same challenges. So I I encourage you to really think about that. And if you have a testimony, make sure that you're always ready to share it. So Liam, when he uh, last, it was Easter Sunday, pastor preached a message And while I was here praying during the invitation for a soul to come to Christ, I had no idea that I was praying for my son. And all in God's work and the conviction on my son's life, he came down from the tech booth and he walked down to the he walked down to the uh, altar here, and he got on his knees without even telling us, and he got into the feet of Jesus and he repented. And he confessed, and he asked Jesus to save him. And he did just that. Liam, 
Have you repented of your sins and trusted on Jesus to save you? Yes, sir. Come here, bud. All right. <clears throat> Try to keep it together here. Based on your profession of faith, I now baptize you, my brother and my son, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of Christ's death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection to walk in newness of life. That was a beautiful thing. Let's pray and then you guys can be dismissed. Lord, thank you so much for a wonderful day. Thank you for the conviction that we felt from the message this morning from Pastor Drew. We thank you for the baptisms today. Such a beautiful outward uh, showing of what your grace has done in those lives and our lives, Lord. We ask that you bless the, the afternoon and our day and help us to uh, meditate and ponder on what we've heard and learned and, and felt. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. Well, that's the conclusion of our message today. What powerful words that we did hear from Holy Bible. And uh, so the question now, and it comes into your court, is what's your response going to be? What are you going to do? You see, we all have a choice to make when we're faced with things where our life contradicts God's Word. And so that could be a plethora of things. And God works on our hearts in such a number of ways. And I don't know where you're at today. Some of you may be dealing with marriage issues. Other of you may be getting ready to lose your house and the financial burdens. They're just too much to bear. Maybe some of you today are struggling spiritually with the fact of looking at your eternity, knowing that if life ended today, you don't know that heaven would be your home. You don't know that Christ is your Savior. Well, I've got great news for you today, and that's what the gospel is. It's good news, is that you've never gone too far. You've never done too much to be out of the reach of God. And so if that's where you're at today, my, my prayer and, and plea for you really is that you would just call upon Him. Just pray, and, and it may seem weird. It may seem awkward. I'm not used to praying. I don't know what to say. That's okay. In your own words today, just call out to God. Ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him to save you. Ask Him to heal you. Ask Him to help you. Whatever it is that you're needing. But, but, but our, our plea for you here is that you would just not walk away carrying those burdens. You see, Christ will take those for you. And we don't want you to go through this alone. That was never God's intention. And this is not our intention uh, as well as the church. Is we want you to walk through this with us. And so we have some ways that you can reach out to us if you need help. Uh, you can uh, contact of the church. You can contact us on social media. We also have an email address, and you can look on our website. And the email address is prayer at faithbaptistlakeland.com. And you can uh, send us exactly what is going on in your heart, and myself or one of our team will be able to get back in contact with you and we'll be able to pray for you and walk with you through that journey. But please, please, please don't walk through this alone. God loves you. He is for you. He's got the best planned for you. And we want to thank you again so much for tuning in to our service today. And we just pray and hope that it's been a blessing for you. And please contact us if there's anything at all that we can do to help you.